My name is Russ Rincioni. This video is not for the establishment. I'm a progressive Democrat running for Congress. As a working class American, I waited tables to put myself through college. Now I'm a public servant. And as a government housing attorney, I fight for what I believe in. Two years ago, my son was born. My life was changed forever. I promised him that I would do whatever it takes to build a better future. But our future is at stake. By 2035, New Jersey homes will be underwater. We'll lose billions in property value. Heat waves, drought, mass extinctions, tornadoes. The climate crisis is here. The way forward is to invest in our future. We can create millions of high paying jobs to usher in a modern age of renewable technology, rebuild our infrastructure, and create the greatest middle class America has ever seen with the Green New Deal. I believe Americans should have the right to breathe clean air, drink pure water, and to enjoy a healthy environment. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. We work longer hours, but our wages stay the same. The cost of health care keeps rising, but covers less. Millions of people have no health insurance, and every year people die because they can't afford it. That's why I support Medicare for All, because it will save money and save lives. Running for Congress wasn't in my plan, but when our representatives said no to the Green New Deal and no to Medicare for All, that's when I knew now is the time to fight. Politicians that take big money from oil and gas lobbyists will never solve the climate crisis. Politicians that take big money from health insurance and pharma lobbies will never give us Medicare for all. We win when we elect people that reject big money. That's why I've pledged to take no fossil fuel, corporate PAC, or lobbyist money, to stay true to working class Americans. We must eliminate corruption in politics. And we won't stop there. We can have opportunity for all with free public college and student loan debt cancellation. And we can have a federal jobs guarantee with a living wage. We can invest in our families with universal child care and paid family leave. New Jersey deserves a leader who puts our working class families first. My name is Russ Serencioni and I'm fighting for justice. Together, we will create an America that works for all of us. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Russ Cirincione running in New Jersey's 6th Congressional District against Frank Pallone, an infamous corporate Democrat who is known as the enforcer for Nancy Pelosi. And he's here to tell us why Frank Pallone's got to go and why he would actually be a voice of change in the Democratic Party. Russ, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. I love your show. So this is really surreal for me being here. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. That means so much. Well, look, I've been following your campaign for a while and I am thoroughly impressed. You pretty much check all of the boxes. You say Medicare for all, but you specify single payer Medicare for all. <laughs> no type of, you know, compromise Medicare choice, Medicare for all who wants it. It's Medicare for all single payer. You're talking about the Green New Deal, student loan debt cancellation. And you are someone who you've kind of been in the trenches fighting for quite some time. You're a government housing attorney, so you're fighting against yes. basically landlords who are taking advantage of tenants, and now you're running for Congress. So what made you want to run? Well, uh, a lot of things, but most importantly, in February when the Green New Deal was announced uh, as the House resolution, uh, you know, for most, of, for most of our generation, we're very concerned with the climate crisis, and the Green New Deal really gives us hope. We can get, uh, we can clean up our environment, and transition to renewable energy because that's what we have to do based on the UN reports. And um, as soon as it came out, my representative said things like, it's not politically possible. It's not technologically possible. And in my mind, that is the most absurd statement I've ever heard because we have the technology and also we have the, uh, we have the research and development and works that we could fully go 100% renewable by 2030. We could do it uh, as soon as possible. And what, when he said that, it just became very frustrating for me because I have a two-year-old son and my son's future is shaped by how we deal with the climate crisis today. His, his life in 10 years is going to be, is directly related by what we do today. If we can't end the fossil fuel age and switch and clean up our environment, I, I just don't want him to be 
uh, faced with dystopia. So at the time, Frank Pallone said no to the Green New Deal. He became one of the biggest threats to my family. And then uh, the the final nail on the coffin really in June, a fossil fuel company uh, tried to put a pipeline through our township in New Jersey and Old Bridge, uh, a fracked gas, uh, natural gas pipeline that would cut through Jersey, provide no economic benefit and go to the Raritan Bay, disrupt the wildlife. They tried to put it within a few miles of my house. And that was the final straw. The fossil fuel company came after my family, came after my son's, the air that my son breathes, threatened him with asthma, threatened him with lung conditions. And at that very moment, I decided that there's nothing that can stop me from doing everything I can to switch to renewable energy, to fight for the Green New Deal, to fight for my son's future. And that's really the main reason I'm in this, because uh, my son's everything to me and my wife. You know. Uh, also, I'm really upset with how corrupt politics is, you know, how the big money dominates everything in our elections. Uh, you know, the, the billionaires uh, really influence our elections so much that we become an uh, oligarchy, right, where our Congress only responds to the donors. And uh, popular opinion has very little effect on what actually gets done in Congress. So that's really upsetting to me because, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a government attorney, so I fight for housing justice. We have ethical rules of loyalty to the state agency that we work for. I want to bring these ethical rules of loyalty to the people in New Jersey's 6th District and in our entire Congress. So that's what I'll be fighting for as well, anti-corruption provisions. Um, and we'll be calling out every single politician that does take money from the billionaires and the corporate PACs and the lobbyists. So we take no corporate cash because we can only control what I do right now. Uh, and in the future, hopefully we'll see a corruption-free government. Yeah, well, thankfully, candidates like you, you're really – trying to set a new standard for the way that you run campaigns. And even if you disadvantage yourself in a sense by not taking that corporate PAC money, you really demonstrate to people that you're going to remain principled. You're not going to sell out. You're not going to accept money from fossil fuel industries that have a financial interest in ruining the planet, ruining you know your own hometown. So I think it's really important. And one thing that I noticed about you is you really do put this strong emphasis on getting money out of politics which is something that we need to talk more about. I mean, we're always focused on the issues, but the root cause to pretty much everything, like all the issues is the commodification of the electoral process, like money and politics. It's making every other mm -hmm. issue that much more difficult to have some type of political solution because everyone takes money from the industry. So they're too afraid to stand up to that industry. And even if you're not necessarily corrupted by an industry in Congress, you know that they can oppose you by bankrolling a future opponent. So nobody's brave enough to really stand up. So it's really important that candidates such as yourself run for Congress. And that's what you're doing. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about your experience uh, fighting for tenant rights, because you shared a couple of really interesting anecdotes on your website about what you went through and who you represented. And I found it absolutely not just fascinating, but really wild because it just really goes to show you how important tenant rights are and why we really need to be talking, I think, more clearly about housing for all. So can you share a couple of personal stories? So I spent a lot of time, I, I spent a lot of time in housing court and, you know, when tenants, uh, tenants' homes are on the line, uh, it's, it's just a psychologically damaging thing to tenants. And, I, you know, I've seen a lot of tenants being uh, frustrated and, like, usually when somebody has a problem with, with their housing, it's because of some, of some other economic problem, right? So, like, they lose their job sometimes um, and then they, they can't pay rent. So, I, I don't see uh, how – I, I want to see more housing justice in our entire country. I, I want to see – uh, broader tenants protections for even uh, especially people in the Midwest that have very few tenant protections. Uh, New York City is actually very good uh, with protecting its tenants. And um, my experience is with enforcing the rent stabilization law. That's what our agency does. We, uh, we, stay, we try to keep a affordable housing stock. Uh, there's about one and a half million apartments that are subject to the law. And uh, so I guess a, per a couple of personal stories. Um, so we deal with harassment issues when a landlord will, will harass a tenant. And with the particular story that I talk about on the website is um, a landlord was allowing a dog to run free in the hallways. And the tenant, the tenant was actually, uh, you know, attacked by the dog, like chased into her apartment. And she complained about the situation. 
And instead of fixing, you know, like keeping the dog in the house or, or in the apartment, the landlord just uh, retaliated against the tenant, which makes no sense. Like all he had to do was keep the dog uh, in, in his home instead of running free in the apartment building. And um, he showed up, he knocked up, he knocked her door and he showed up right in front of her and he threatened her life. He threatened to kill her. He actually shoved a pistol in her face and said, how dare you, uh, you know, complain about this condition. And so what we did, we, we call, the police got involved and we, uh, we, we made sure that the tenant had the proper protections against this landlord. Uh, so yeah, so we remedied the situation by, um, by, by getting like help there get restraining orders and also, uh, you know, enforcing the, the rent law. So, uh, we reduced her rent for a while as well because she had to deal with these psychological damages, but really what, what, the entire goal of a housing program in our country should be uh, protecting affordable housing. We need to overturn the uh, the draconian rules that are in place now that doesn't allow the federal government to invest in construction of new affordable housing. Uh, and instead of just repairing this really outdated housing stock, we have to start investing in affordable housing, actually doing the work and building it. Uh, so that's that's what's central to our plat- my platform as well. If we want to end homelessness, we can. We really can. Uh, and we can do it by building affordable housing for everybody. I'm really glad that you shared that because you, I think, better than most people know about that power imbalance between landlords and tenants. And, you know, we need to make sure that we are empowering people and we're talking about housing for all. And I'm so glad that so many candidates running in 2020 are actually bringing up this issue, elevating it. And Bernie Sanders, thankfully, uh, released a phenomenal plan that is a housing for all plan that could potentially end homelessness. So it's really nice to really see this issue take front and center in the election. And it's so important. But I mean, it's not it's not the only issue that you're running on. You have a pretty robust platform. And what's really remarkable to me is that so many candidates running for Congress, they're platforms are more comprehensive than most presidential candidates, which is mind blowing. But it kind of just goes to show that like you guys running for Congress, you care more about policy than most politicians who are just career minded, you know, who want to who want to advance their own career. So talk about some of the other things that are at the top of your list in terms of what you think you'd be able to to accomplish or what you'd fight for in that first year in the event you're elected. So we, we went over Medicare for all single payer. Uh, in New Jersey, we pay the fifth highest in the country for our health insurance. It'll see the average uh, New Jerseyan around $3,000 a year. Um, you know, the Green New Deal is the top part of our platform uh, because we have to beat the climate crisis. Like we have enemies at our doorsteps trying to invade and destroy our homes. Um, and the anti-corruption provisions, which an American Anti-Corruption Act, which could be passed through Congress and actually uh, end, the, end the stranglehold of lobbyists. Uh, I, want to, I want to end hunger. We can end hunger by feeding people. I want to create thousands of indoor uh, hydroponic uh, or aquaponic uh, vertical farms that will produce organic food. We have to really rethink our food bill, our, our, uh, our farm bill. And for New Jersey in particular, it's about a billion dollar a year industry. We're the top producers of different fruits and vegetables here. Uh, we have almost a million acres of farmland. And um, so to, to me, what we really have to do is invest in sustainable organic farming. Uh, our current food bill actually subsidizes corn and cotton. And I don't know when the last time anybody ate cotton was, but it does not belong in a food bill. You know, um, we actually do not subsidize organic farming. It accounts for less than 1% of our farm bill and our, and our investments there. Uh, and we have to change that because, you know, organic farming is uh, pesticide free. And to reduce the costs, indoor vertical farming essentially allows you to use no pesticides because it's an indoor contained environment. And if we construct these across the country, they can be community, community owned, uh, commu- create thousands of community jobs. And also we could feed the people who need it the most. And we could also provide low cost organic food for everybody. So everybody wins. Um, so that's another part of the, our platform. Uh, there's, there's so many things like we have to expand disability rights. We have to fight for digital privacy rights. Uh, I believe in regulating cryptocurrencies and clarifying tax issues there. Um, you know, and also free public college. Of course, we need that and canceling student loan debt. Because if we want to be competitive on a world stage, we have to have a well-educated workforce. And to, to really uh, in debt like 50 million Americans 
uh, and tie them to this uh, like sometimes six figure student loan debts is is uh, is unacceptable to me. I mean, personally, I have student loans as well. My wife and I have them. And, you know, uh, we're, we're really lucky that we that we were able to um, we're able to afford like a lot of things of modern life. But I, I just think that it's a drain on the economy. And if we unlock that economic potential by forgiving the student loan debt and canceling it fully, then we'll have a an, an insanely uh, an insane economic boost in the next few years, which pays for itself over a decade. Yeah, that's that's really encouraging to hear. I totally agree with the student loan thing. Um, I have student loan debt that um, if it were canceled, I can guarantee I would stimulate the economy. And I think a lot of millennials would agree with that. So it's it's an economic Absolutely. stimulus that we desperately need. And just to allow millennials like our generation to have that economic mobility or a start at like just less burden even. I mean, that in and of itself would be remarkable. So you are running against someone who I think is a political behemoth, Frank Pallone. He's really mm -hmm. one of the worst. I think a lot of people know about Frank Pallone who watch this show, but if they don't, tell us why you think Frank Pallone needs to be primaried. I, I think that you have a lot of things to go off of, but like in your mind, what's like the top reasons why you think he should be primary. And I, I love that in your ad, you hit him for all the financial contributions that he takes. But uh, what do you think it is about Frank Pallone that makes him unable to represent his constituents adequately? So, uh, so honestly, in my opinion, our election, our primary is probably in the top four or five most important uh, elections in the country. And that's because Frank Pallone chairs the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. So he's the chairman, and a lot of people don't really understand what powers a chairman of a committee has. So anyone can introduce a bill to a house, the House floor, but then it's assigned to a specific committee with jurisdiction. The Energy and Commerce Committee has jurisdiction of about 60% of all the legislation that passes through the House of Representatives. So bills like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal, they both wind up in his committee, and he has been actively blocking those bills. He, he had a hearing on health insurance uh, in June and did not even bring Medi the Medicare for All bill, HR 1384, you know, to the Jayapal proposal. He did not even bring that to the hearing. He did not bring it to the committee. And it's essentially going to be stopped there forever. He took $1 million from the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance lobbies last cycle alone. And they're still funding his elections. He will never, ever pass Medicare for all. And he will be the person in power that can effectively stop it. Even if we have Bernie Sanders in the White House, he can stop Medicare for all through his committee. Uh, he could stop the Green New Deal from his committee as well. He is he has uh, actually I think he might have the sole jurisdiction over the Green New Deal bill if we propose one. And um, he actually has proposed his own uh essentially do nothing plan 100% uh, carbon neutral by 2050, which we know will be about 20 years too late. And it will allow for natural gas investments to continue for the next uh, 30 years. And that's not something that we, our planet can take. That's not something that, that we can compromise on. We have to end the investments in fossil fuels. Uh, and he's taken a million dollars over the course of his career from the fossil fuel industry. So fundamentally, uh, because he takes this money and because of his position, he will never, ever give any votes for the progressive ideals that we want to fight for. And replacing him on the Energy and Commerce Committee would be hugely instrumental to passing a progressive platform in 2020 and beyond. And I, I honestly believe anyone who takes fossil fuel money deserves a primary challenge because they will not regulate the fossil fuel companies the way that we need to in the, in the next few years. Um, and, you know, if we really care about uh, about these progressive ideals, which we really do, uh, we have to replace the corporate Democrats that will propose middle of the ground, do nothing, uh, half ass solutions. And so that's really uh, important to our district as well. We have many miles, like 30 miles of coastline um, in our district. And. The climate crisis is going to destroy our homes. We literally have houses a few feet 
from the Atlantic Ocean. From the Atlantic Ocean, we are, we have houses a few feet from from bay areas. So the rising sea levels is, is very concerning for the people here. And in his recent town hall, almost every single person asked him one of two questions: Will you support Medicare for all, or will you support the Green New Deal? And his answer was no, 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 a thousand times. Blaming it on the Republicans, blaming it on blaming it on his donors that are going to run run ads against him. He called Medicare for all socialism. He is afraid of the very people that fund his campaign. He's afraid of their campaign ads calling him a socialist. Like for Medicare for all, they call, they called Obamacare socialism. You know, that argument doesn't hold any water when we have 45,000 people in our district alone without health insurance. So we're fighting for Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. Those are the two most important issues for our district. And we're going to replace them in June 2020. So I'm excited. That's great. Well, and I wanted to ask you because, you know, I feel like anyone who's in that district, there's no way that they enjoy putting up with him. Like, this is a fairly blue district. Like, you don't have to put up with someone who is this conservative, this right wing, quite frankly. And everyone in the country, they really have a vested interest in seeing you succeed because this is something that doesn't just affect that district that you're living in. I mean, it certainly affects you the most. But I mean, if he's a barrier to Medicare for all, then absolutely, we all have to coalesce around your campaign and get him out of office. But what I wanted to ask you was, what do you think it would take? Because you're not taking corporate cash, and he is, so he's going to have that monetary advantage. What do you think it would mm -hmm. take to make you uh, viable uh, in 2020? Because I know you're knocking on a lot of doors, but how much do you think you'd have to raise in order to be competitive? Uh, to be competitive, if we raise $150,000, we will definitely be uh, extremely co competitive. Uh, and, you know, if we, if we go up to 300K, then I think that we are, we're going to win the election. Uh, because uh, we, have, we have a district that's pretty, pretty wide, right? So uh, it traces the, the coastal shoreline very narrowly. So it's geographically long. Uh, but we do have urban areas. We have uh, very dense urban areas. So, but we can we can win with really not much money, and this is a safe democratic district. Uh, the cook uh, the cook rating is like plus nine. Uh, so there's really no reason for our representative to be taking this corporate cash, uh, especially because he wins against the Republicans every single year in like like almost uh, in five 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 figures or six figures ahead in votes. So, yeah, uh, basically. We don't need that much money, but we, we definitely need a little bit. We have campaign staff, volunteers right now, a few paid. Uh, I am now on part time at my at my job to dedicate to four, at least four days a week, plus every weeknight um, to our campaign. So we're hitting the ground running, though, starting in uh, right after this November 5th election, which is just a few days away. I kind of feel like every single primary challenger will win hands down if every voter knows about you. Because I think that the pitch that you're making, it makes sense, it's going to resonate with people. It's just a matter of, will people actually know who you are or will they just vote based on name recognition? What's the response that you've gotten from constituents? Because I can't imagine that in a deep blue district like that, they're too happy with Frank Pallone. Uh, no, so they're not. Uh, <laughs> every, every single person that I speak to are uh, very excited about uh, the Green New Deal, how it's a jobs program, how it's going to save our planet. And also Medicare for All makes a lot of sense to most people who have dealt with health pro health issues. Um, so uh, people are very responsive here. I think our district pulls extremely well with all of our progressive ideas. Um, and I mean, this district deserves to be represented by somebody with bold policy platforms that will stand up to the billionaire class. And that's what that's what I'm fighting for. We have to stand up to those in power and demand equality and justice for everybody in our district. There's so many people that work um, on the minimum wage here, almost 100,000 people. And that's why I believe in a loving wage, a raising the, the minimum wage to $20 an hour plus indexed to inflation because – um, if we want to stimulate the economy, that's the best way to do it, which is really interesting. I think just yesterday there's been a study on the New York City minimum wage increase to $15 an hour in the restaurant industry. And uh, they've, they've found that it's actually increased employment and increased uh, restaurant spending. So it's a boom on the economy if we raise the minimum wage. Our 
minimum wage in New Jersey is going to up to fifteen dollars an hour in twenty twenty four. But I think that I, I don't even think that's enough for that time period. And why are we waiting until twenty twenty four, which should just be happening now? Um, so yeah, all of our issues are very popular. Um, so, but you know, uh, challenging incumbent, the, uh, the establishment people know him very well, but I still have conversations with them. And a lot of people that are even elected officials have shown like, you know, like respect They're They're basically like, yeah, I, I, they respect what we're doing because we deserve a primary. We deserve options. This is a democracy and the more options, the better. And so people everywhere have been responding well to our campaign. So That's really encouraging to hear. Let me ask you this, because if you're elected, we already know that you will be one of the main targets of Donald Trump, of Fox News. You'll be a member of the squad, a new member of the squad, round two. Um, You'll be deemed, you know, a socialist, possibly a communist by Fox News. What do you do to basically push through that noise and still fight for an agenda? And on top of that, how do you basically push back against internal forces within the Democratic Party who's going to try to get you to soften your stance on a number of issues? So the internal uh, infighting will, will be very interesting because that's what I'm really worried about. Like, I, I think that we're going to, Democrats are going to win the presidency. I think that Democrats are going to win the Senate and the, and the House. But I'm really afraid of just the centrist corporate Democrats being the ones with the reins of power. And it's going to be another, like, Obama- uh, rehash where we don't get much done, where we um, where where we pretty much stall, and every single uh, working populist platform is pretty much uh, um, pretty much catapulted into uh, you know non-existence. Really, uh, I mean we we need to get the the anti-corruption bill reform passed. Uh, that's a very very big priority, and I actually intend on uh, being very aggressive against uh, Republicans uh, who. I want I want to be firing the first shots against them instead of being always on the defense. I think that's very powerful with Donald Trump against Donald Trump and Republicans because uh, we have to put them on the back foot and really make them defend their positions because we have the popular platforms. We, we're calling for good jobs. We're calling for unions. We're calling for saving the planet. We're calling for uh, health care for all. What, what are what are they arguing for? Health care for less Uh, Like, you know, yeah, the right to work laws must be abolished. We have to abolish those everywhere. So I think so I'm going to be one of the biggest anti-corruption Democrats calling out even people in our own party who take that money, especially when they won't vote for uh, working class reforms like, uh, you know, like a higher minimum wage. And I'm going to be bringing the fight to Republicans, too, on their doorsteps. You know, Bernie Sanders actually recently said that he's going to be holding rallies in uh, other you know, in other districts with who, against whoever uh, won't vote for things that we want to get done, like you know, like the Green New Deal, and I, I intend on doing a similar thing. Go, I will rally in somebody else's district, uh, working people, uh, and make sure that they feel the public pressure. I'll also, you know, uh, I want to help uh, organ, organizing everywhere. I don't want to just be, this is this is really a, about the movement. This is not about Russ. This is about our movement here. We're building this movement in New Jersey because we've been uh, progressives have been really scattered across the state, but we're actually really building um, building coalitions across the board. So that's important to do in our state. Uh, we're going to start here first, and then we're going to keep bringing it nationally and uh, empowering other people to organize. I think is the most important thing that we can do because uh, you know I believe in leading from behind. I believe in um, you know, I don't. I don't want the spotlight. I, I want this to be people's, uh, the people's movement, and we have to empower each other and and work together everywhere. I love that answer because, like, when I ask that question occasionally to candidates, like, what I really want to hear is. I'm going to fight them like I'm going to fight Republicans. I'm going to fight Democrats. I'm going to call them out because like advocating for policies, that's incredibly important in and of itself. But we need people who are going to get in there and crack schools. So I always try (laughs) to see if I can get that sense from a candidate. And the fact that you affirm that it really makes it clear that, I mean, this isn't even a choice. Like if people know about you, you're winning hands down. So I want you to make your pitch because basically this is about name recognition. If people know about you in New Jersey's 6th Congressional District, you win, I think, hands down. It's just a matter of getting the name out there. And unfortunately, you know, a fact of reality is you need money to do that. So tell us what we can do to help you, where we can donate and how we can get involved with your campaign. Because I think that anyone who's watching this will be convinced and they're going to want to help you out. So what can we do? 
Yeah, so we have a, a really good website with all of our policies there. It's russforus2020.com, R-U-S-S-F-O-R-U-S 2020.com. Uh, there's a volunteer form there where we, we're looking for volunteers across the country. Uh, we need help online organizing and also um, you know, giving the message out more. So definitely sign up there. There's a donate link there. We definitely appreciate any contributions because we're grassroots, we're people funded, taking no corporate cash. And uh, so about me, I have the experience as a as a legislator as well. So we, we need a legislator. We also need a public advocate. And so being like a public interest attorney, fighting for the common good, I've drafted laws uh, in New York, actually, that have passed that protect tenants from manufactured homes. So I have experience as a legislator and we definitely need more like good guy attorneys in Congress. Good, good guy lawyers that have the fight that have the back of the people. Um, you know, I was a waiter for almost a decade before through college and through law school, working 40 hours a week. So I've been there on the on the working struggle uh, and the working class struggle. Um, I've worked alongside, you know, uh, immigrants and other college students and and moms and 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 people of all types. Uh, so that's that's really why I have a fundamental belief, the fundamental beliefs that I have here where we need a working class movement. We need unions. We need higher minimum wages. Um and, you know, uh, our, our, our movement is about continuing the work of the people here. We're continuing the work that Bernie Sanders is doing. We're, we're linking up with everyone. We're building power here. And we appreciate any contribution, of course. But this moment in time is the most important ever. Because right now, our future selves are watching us. And we're going to ask ourselves, when the Amazon was on fire, when California was on fire, when there were massive hurricanes everywhere, what were we doing to stop it, to fight it, to bring a new movement to clean up our environment? And now is the time to be involved. It doesn't have to be very, very dedicated. If you, if you could spare a few hours a week, every campaign locally could definitely use the help. And Mike, I thank you so much for having me here. Um, and you know, like I said, our campaign is super important nationally and we need all the help we can get because we're a small team right now. We've raised about $15,000, but we're, we're, we're really, um, we're only about 10% of the way we, where we have to be. So, um, yeah, so we're going, we're going to win. Bernie Sanders is going to win and the progressive movements are going to win and it might as well be right now in the next election, you know? Absolutely. Well, look, anyone who's watching this knows it's not even a debate. You are hands down better than Frank Pallone. And I'm confident like with with all of these people, I was telling Russ before we started that for the first time, I actually feel a little bit optimistic just because there's so many <laughs> great candidates running for Congress. So like my cynical heart is starting to kind of like, you know, it's starting to grow a little bit, right? Not too much, but a little bit just seeing everyone kind of get involved. So let's help Russ help us. Let's get him elected. Russ Sirincione, he is someone who can actually change the country. Russ, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me and good night, everybody.